Welcome to Blue Stories, a collection of yarns spun by Jason Beachy. In these videos, he will be documenting the true and tall tales of his life and career as a superstar blues harmonica demon and God. You will hear first-hand accounts of his rise and fall and strange, seamy encounters with legends and obscure artists alike. Some of the names have been changed to protect the living. There are no innocents in the blues. Hey everybody, this is Jason Ritchie with a new episode of Blues Stories. This is becoming my most requested thing to do on YouTube. And uh, I'm sorry I don't get more of them out. Uh, I got a big one for you today. So this is the story of the Kimbros in the Burnsides. So this is... Uh, a huge one that I get asked about uh, surprisingly not as much as you, you'd think I would uh, considering how popular those guys are now which I guess is a great place to start the story but back when I first met those guys those guys weren't uh, they weren't very big they weren't very popular so we're talking around 1995 so I was living in Memphis I was down there studying Pat Ramsey, which if you remember, you've seen the other blues story on Pat. And uh, I was down there hanging out with him and uh, I had a job at an Italian restaurant and uh, I was waiting tables. And uh, <clears throat> this is just nicotine, by the way, guys. You guys who write that think I'm smoking weed, I'm not, okay? It's just, it's just like a way to get down off of nicotine. Don't worry about it, okay? But I appreciate your concerns. <laughs> so I... Anyway, when you do blue stories, you have to smoke, right? Blue stories, it's like the old days with the pipe, right? Where you're sitting there with the golden retriever in the, in the fireplace, you know? So anyway, back to the story. So I was living down there, and um, I was kind of um, starting to screw up. I had lost the job. I had lost a job at, uh, at Grisani's and um, I was kind of floundering. I was drinking and, and I started doing uh, a lot of cocaine and started smoking crack and all this scary stuff. And um, I was like, uh, had to move out of my apartment and I was living in this flop house <clears throat> with this harmonica player who used to play in Handy Park. His name was Jeff. I don't remember his last name, big guy. Um, I don't think he's around anymore. And um, he had the, I, I call it a flop house because I mean, he there were people that, you know, like you'd, you could pay a certain amount of money to go up there for night, per night and stay. And, um, or you could pay a certain amount of money a week which is what I was doing. And I, I had like these uh, four pieces of drywall drywall put up in like this warehouse above this liquor store. It was right next to Sun Studios. If you go down to Union, there's a, a liquor store right there on this little corner. And then the first door after that liquor store on the right was where I was living up above with a guitar player named Fred Sanders. Who who had some success, um, I think, in his former years, but it was now playing with, uh, not now, but then was playing with Jeff in the park. And those guys did okay down there. Um, uh, Big T was the bass player. There's another blue story right there. So <laughs> anyway, um, I was in a bad way. So one day I went, I was playing for tips uh, down on, uh, on, uh, Beale Street, and I had this, uh, boom box 
like a, an old like little ghetto blaster thing and it had a quarter inch input it was from the 70s my buddy Alma had given it to me and it sounded pretty good I mean obviously it was solid state but you know I could put batteries in it and bring it out and play through it and get loud enough to get people's attention and make a few bucks so anyway I was down on Beale Street playing and uh, little Jimmy King was playing at BB King's club and so I, I was down the street a ways and I was just I would pick up whatever heart the band was playing in because they were so loud and I would just play over that you know and it wasn't so loud they could hear it in there but I could you know just play against the music and uh, these guys come walking down the street and they're like checking me out so it turns out that's David Malone Kimbrough Uh, Gary Burnside and Dwayne, and Dwayne Burnside and, and Kent Kimbrough, who they call who they call Kenny or Kinney, you know. Um, anyway, they liked what I was doing and they said they were in town to find a saxophone player but that you know maybe I could get the job or something right so like <laughs> you know uh they told me where to meet them you know drive uh down 78 and get to Holly Springs and meet them at the pizza the next day so uh I did. I, I got in my car. I, I uh, took my tip money and put it in the gas tank. And I, and I drove to, to Holly Springs to the Pizza Hut. And f sure as shit, there they were. And they met me. So David Kimbrough, um, I like auditioned for, the, for David, who was Junior's oldest son. And uh, still lives in Holly Springs and has his own juke joint, which I think he named Juniors, which is a club I'll talk about, actually. He bought it from the original owners. It used to be called Sue's. A anyway, um, so like I went to, David was living at this house he was renting from this guy named Willie B, who was like right out of like, like any like black exploitation movie. I mean, he had like the Jerry Cur Curl and Willie B's house was like a seventies, like pimp daddy house with like leopard skin and like the bar and the neon lights and like all this cool stuff. And that's where David lived, you know? So he was living pretty good, you know? And, uh, and, uh, you know, I was, I'm from Maine, you know, so I was pretty weird, you know, and th that town, that, that house was in an old town called Potts Camp, so we did the ad audition there, and um, they liked me, and David asked me, uh, like, point blank, like, what I was doing, and did I have, like, a drug problem and stuff, and, you know, like, I don't know why, but for some reason I told him, like, the truth, I said, yeah, I, actually, I... I do. I've been smoking crack a lot and stuff like that. And he was like, this is like 95. He's like, all right. He's like, you know, um, this is what we're going to do. You're going to move here and you're not going to fuck with that shit. And you're going to play with me. So we <clears throat> drove back up to Memphis and got like I, what little stuff I had up there, you know, I, which is, I was glad to get out of there. There, there were rats like big ones that were, like my bed was on the floor you know what I mean and they were crawling all around and stuff and you know it was scary uh and you know I was out of control at that time too you know I was just getting I was getting in a lot of trouble so I, I moved on down to uh to Potts Camp and uh and you know I started just drinking uh they had this corn liquor there which I loved it was like to me, it was, like, way better than alcohol, like, regular alcohol. Like, for me, for some reason, like, I didn't feel like I got drunk on this. Like, I got loaded, but, like, not drunk. Like, of course, I was drunk. 
okay? I would have way more blues stories to tell you if I wasn't drinking that shit all the time for the time I was with them. And yeah, I was smoking a little weed and stuff and I was playing with David. And so the very first night that I, after I moved in, my stuff, David, took me to that club called Sue's. And it was really scary there. Uh, like there was like uh, uh, somebody got stabbed that night in the parking lot, like right when we pulled in. And uh, there was like, like no cops or anything. Like they just got in their car afterwards, <laughs> like uh, drove away. And you know, here I was like, you know, this is like in the city of Holly Springs, or I guess it's more a town, but you know, it was a urban populated area and I was like the only white kid like there like period like nobody around there and like uh so uh anyway uh I was definitely out of my element and like you know people like knew it so like I I just went in and I put my amp on st- um, there wasn't a stage, it was just a floor. It was kind of like, and, and well, the weird thing was we were kind of playing in the middle of the club, like instead of like against a wall or something. So like, I just like sat on the amp. <laughs> okay, like I wouldn't leave. Like, so everybody knew the only reason I was there was to play music, right? So that there was no question about why would I go in there? Like, I'm not trying to start something because man the only reason any white person would go into this place other to play music or to listen to music and to listen I mean I I would suspect it'd been better if you knew somebody (laughs) you know what I mean so like uh I just sat on the amp and uh David uh and I played a couple of tunes and then they he said hey man uh I want to introduce you to uh R.L. Burnside. So I had heard R.L. Burnside on this recording, you know, um, solo acoustic. It was like a French album, like an import or an export or whatever you call it. It was a French vinyl that this guy Bart Payne had played for me who was the owner of a record label called Alleyway Records. And I used to party with Bart, and he played me all this cool shit. And man, he could sing too. Alabama guy from Gadsden. Um, Yeah, that that cat was interesting too. That's another great story. But he had turned me on to RL, and I knew that this was serious stuff. So I I was very much interested in this. So anyway, I... uh, RL, I play with RL for the very first time I ever saw him. And, uh, you know, we did that Jumper on the Line um, song. And I, you know, today I do that tune. Uh, I really like the lyrics. I did not understand what the lyrics were back then. I don't think I heard much of anything other than where the maybe the backbeat was supposed to go. Or maybe I didn't even know where it was supposed to go. I, I, I just tried to play it, Hank. Anyway, um, thus began a long, uh, well, not too long, but a, about, I don't know, a little over a year, 15, 17 months, something, maybe, maybe almost two years, I don't know, of it's playing in all of those juke joints with those guys. So Junior was not famous at all. Um, nobody knew who he was. Um, I, as far as I understand back then, the Kimbros were only doing like four big gigs a year, which at that time there were four House of Blueses. I think there was one in Cambridge, there was one in Hollywood, one in Chicago, and maybe one in Florida. I think that was it. And they would they would fly them to all four, and they would do all four of them. And um, I was never invited on those gigs. Um, Eric Deaton was, and I wanted to do a blues story on Eric. I will do one on Eric eventually, because that's a guy that you guys should look into. If you love this music, because that's a real, you know, unsung hero of this music that a lot of influential artists today 
know who he is, and some of them even learned directly from him, including yours truly. And Eric was, as far as I know, the second real white boy besides Kenny Brown, who grew up there, to go into that scene and actually learn that music. And he played it on bass and guitar, both. And um, he was cool, is very, very cool. And he has a lot of bands. Anyway, this is gonna be a long blue story, so maybe pause it, go get a drink, go get some coffee. I'm not gonna try to rush through a story about the Kimbros, okay, and the Burnsides. And there's no point in rushing a subject like this. So you sit back and relax, get some popcorn, and here we go. So, um, yeah, man, Eric Deaton was down there, Kenny Brown was down there, and me. Those were the only three white people. Now, you may think, well, what does it matter? Why is Jason, you know, bringing race into this issue? <laughs> but I'll tell you what, you go down there now when it's all you know, homogenized comparatively to how it was in 95 as a white boy or a white woman, and you tell me it doesn't matter. You get down in there in that situation, and it's a different type of thing, okay? Um, you know, I learned a lot from this situation. I learned a lot about myself and, and my culture which I didn't think, you know, white people really had a culture. You know, I didn't think there really were jokes about white people. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't think there was anything wrong with us or the way we did things. Turns out there was a lot of things wrong with the way I grew up. And, uh, and uh, you know, and, and I had, and I had uh, the opportunity to see some of those things. Maybe we'll get to some of that. Um... This is, uh, this is all very sensitive stuff, man, you know, it's still to this day, but you know what, it's not. If I was down there and talking to David, it, it wouldn't be <laughs> sensitive at all, because he's so cool. Please check out David Malone Kimbrough on Facebook and on YouTube and on his records. His album that was out then was on Fat Possum called I Got the Dog in Me. And what an incredible record it was. And what it was. And what it, what it, you know. Uh, you know, they say that there's no racism in the blues. White people complain that, oh, you know, it, you know, it, you know, if I was black, I'd get more people would listen to my music. And black people complain, you know, if I was white, more people would listen to mine. I, I just, I don't know what the deal is. I, I do, I do believe that David Kimbrough has been overlooked and that he is one of the most important living blues people and not just because he's related to Junior. Okay, but what he was doing musically and is doing musically and, and still keeping the music alive in Holly Springs today is immensely important. And I think, uh, I think uh, all of anybody, if anybody in power of any kind in this business of blues is watching this, please look into what you can do for David. Um, David did a lot for me. He took me into his home. He gave me food and other things. And um, he gave me a room to stay in. He, he treated me as if I was family. And um, that was something that my people would have never done for basically a stranger who was learning to play music that was part of his heritage, not mine, okay? I was a tourist in that world. And, um, and to this day, I know that, okay? Um, and I know what was really important was me learning who I was. And 
a lot of that began in Pods Camp and Holly Springs and Senatobia and Oxford, Mississippi, and that area of that we now, you know, that's referred to as a North Mississippi area. I started going to those Sunday juke joints. Um, RL had one called RL's Palace. I think that was Saturday nights and Junior had one on Sundays. RL's didn't go off every Saturday, but it was cool. I hung out with Dwayne Burnside. I hung out with RL Burnside. I hung out with Kenny Brown. Um, I played that music with those guys frequently. I hung out at their houses. Um, I uh, went into our, I one night I took Valium for the first time in Oxford. Some uh, the governor's son gave me uh, Valium, and I uh, I uh, never taken it before. And I was driving home, and I got too tired, and I ended up at RL's house. I might get in trouble for telling this story. But I'll tell it. So anyway, I get there. And we go inside the house, you know, and I've been in there before. RL had a chain around the refrigerator. He had 13 kids living at that house at the time. And um, I was nervous because being from Maine, I wasn't used to cockroaches. And there was lots of cockroaches. Not because they were dirty, because there's lots of cockroaches in Mississippi. <laughs> okay. Um, and I was nervous. So uh, I was just sitting there and the Valium was starting to kick in. I was just sitting in a chair, like like a chair you'd get at school with four legs. And they were, man, those roaches were everywhere. Like they were crawling up the side of the chair. They were just crawling on me. Eventually I lied down on the couch and they were all over me and I heard this squeaking noise. And I got up and I pulled up the couch and there was a, a baby mouse, a mouse with its little babies under the couch. And I was so nervous, uh, I couldn't sleep there. I went and I slept inside my car. And the next morning they came out, man, you know, you don't ever want to tell somebody that you don't like their house down there. You know, that's a big insult. And, uh, but I'm afraid of bugs, you know. So um, I, I just told them uh, a lie that when I was a little kid, a bug had crawled into my ear and I had an irrational phobia of bugs. It was true, I had an irrational phobia of bugs, but I was scared to sleep in the Burnside's house. So I never did. I woke up and all they were all playing poker, man. And they were like, you know, threats on people's lives. You know what I mean? Not they were playing craps on a picnic table. You know, the kids. Uh, all kinds of stuff happened down there, man. There's a lot of stuff I I actually probably can't really tell. Uh, but I'll tell I'll tell you a lot of it. That that story right there, you know. Uh, Anyway, Gary Burnside treated me, you know, very nicely considering I was, you know, kind of a spoiled little brat and, um, you know, those guys were engaged in activity, you know, that was, um, dangerous and, um, but you know, they were all very serious musicians. So let's stick to the music. So I was there and I was playing with David. I was learning David's tune. We were, we had a band, you know, it was Junior Kimbrough and the Soul Blues Boys, okay? It was, was Pops, as they used to call him. David used to call him Pops. Um, and I used to hang out with Junior at this little record store at Holly Springs. He used to park his Cadillac right out in front of it and sit there. And I would come and I, I would sit in the car with him and just out there. And he wouldn't say anything for a long time. And then sometimes he'd ask me how I was doing and stuff. And I'd tell him. And he'd ask me what it was like and if things were okay over at David's house and shit like that. And he always kind of looked out for me, you know. And he was very mellow. According to David, when he was young, he was not as mellow. <laughs> he got older and he mellowed out. And I believe that. Um, so, uh, you know, I was doing this, this, uh, this, uh, this thing every, every Sunday. I remember one, oh, this is a good story. So, like, uh, I had this, uh, back then I was just playing a bullet mic through a, a basement. And uh, I was playing it. 
and uh, and uh, this this guy had told me, and I don't remember where I heard this story, but he said, man, he said this is what you you should do, or this is what I saw done once. He told me this story about he saw a guy that took a bullet mic and put it up between a woman's legs and had her hold it there, and then took the harmonica and put it in his mouth and put it up to the bullet mic and put his hands out like this, like he was, you know, eating her pussy, right? So like, I don't know where I got the nerve to fucking do this, but one day I was fronting the band, which, hey man, you know, like, you know, I fronted the band at Junior Kimbrough's. Okay, let me translate what fronting the band at Junior Kimbrough's means. Okay, it means Junior's tired, or has some other business, it means David is gambling in the back or is making money in a variety of fashions. It means nobody else wants to be on stage except the little white kid from Maine, okay? So that's what fronting the band at Junior Kimbrough's amounts to, okay? For those of you who may have heard other people say they fronted the band at Junior Kimbrough's, okay? <laughs> It's it's no big thing, dude. You're just there because no one else wants to be at that particular time. There's more cool things happening than music, if you know what I'm saying. So anyway, I'm up there, and it's like my first time doing it, and I'm doing Scratch My Back, the old Slim Harpo song with a couple of guys. I don't even know if I had a bass player, you know what I mean? Just up there, drums and harmonica, and I think maybe guitar. I don't know what the heck was <laughs> And I decided I was going to do this thing. There was this woman, Big Mama, that loved me. You know, this huge woman, you know, and she loved me, man. And um, I back then, I was so skinny. And I uh, I, I went up to her, man. I, I don't know how I got the nerve to do this. And I stuck that bullet mic <laughs> between her legs. And I, I put my mouth there, and I did that thing. And I was flirting with her the whole time I was doing scratch my back before that, you know, there that place went crazy and I was in after that I was I was in you know what I mean they uh, <laughs> they were very cool everybody treated me like family you know after that uh, that's a funny story yeah a little bit embarrassing but very very funny so uh, anyway uh, doing every Sunday I would play some gigs in Oxford so uh you know, um, it was an immense experience. Uh, I learned a lot about, uh, about myself. I learned that I'm not, uh, that this music is not, you know, I wanted to be black at that time. You know, I had the Easter egg colored suits and I used to put my hair up there like Elvis and try to be like a little pompadour and stuff. And, uh, you know, I was trying to do that thing. I was trying to be the real blues, you know. And I would even try to talk like those guys and stuff. And that shit didn't fly, man, you know, down there. And eventually, I learned that the more I just acted like myself, the better, you know, kind of responses I was getting and stuff. But there was, uh, there was definitely some fine lines that I crossed on occasions and, and I paid for it. I paid for it. There's an article uh, that uh, Adam Gusso wrote about a, you know, a, a scenario that happened, um, you know, where, where I, got, I got the shit kicked out of me one night, okay, by David, <clears throat> which wasn't really my fault, actually. <laughs> David, you know, if you're watching this, uh, you know, he, he'd been out partying, you know, he came back and, um, and I started some shit with him because he had my car and he'd been gone too long, you know, and I missed a gig up in Memphis where I was supposed to sub for Pat Ramsey and I was mad and I decided I was going to do something about it and I had been like practicing karate kicks and shit in the yard for two days <laughs> And uh, he came home and, uh, you know, I confronted him about it and uh, that it was not the right time to confront him about it. And, uh, and I paid for that. Uh, 
I, I got I got whooped very hard and uh, and you know I probably didn't get whooped for that I probably got whooped for a whole that that in that scenario I was right but I, I mean the guy took my car and was gone you know David you know you're wrong for that you know you are right you know so like but that's okay check this out like David if you're watching I, I know you took me in your own and you put clothes on my back and you put food in my stomach and you shared every minute of your life and your culture and your music with me. The most intimate details of who you are and what this music is about and who your father was and who those people were that played this music and the church and God and the devil we talked about that stuff. You gave that to me. And I got upset about a stupid fucking car. Got upset about pants. Got upset about bullshit that I thought I owned when you were sharing everything with me. That's bullshit. And I was wrong for that. And that was some white people shit. <laughs> You know what? I'm not even going to blame this on white people. That was some selfish shit on my part. Some entitled fucking bullshit. And I thank you today for an opportunity to tell a story about what it was like to play with a musician as good as you. As good as David Kimbrough. So anyway, I left after that night that I got whooped and uh, I left without saying anything in the middle of the night I went up and stayed with Billy Gibson for a couple of weeks and I ended up getting a job with a band called The Hounds down in Jackson, Mississippi Fingers Taylor would play that gig six months of the year when he wasn't with Buffett the other six months of the year that he would go out with Buffett, I had the gig and toured regionally, New Orleans and uh, Arkansas, <clears throat> Mississippi, Alabama. So um, anyway, uh, I was living down in Jackson for a little while and I decided I wanted to start my own band, you know, because the Hounds, I think, broke up or something. Yeah, they broke up. So I was like, man, what am I going to do? So. I decided I was going to go back to Maine, you know, for the summer and, and, and do my own band, like where I could start singing more, where I wouldn't, where it didn't matter as much to me as it did in Mississippi. Like I could go up to Maine and if I sounded like crap singing, <laughs> I didn't think it would matter up there, you know? So I went back up there. I hung out with Nick Kern for a little while <clears throat> and I know blue stories on Nick Kern. Check it out. And, uh, and then I went uh, back to, uh, oh yeah, no, 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 Here, here's the story. So on my way back up to go to Maine from Jackson, I had to pass through Holly Springs. Now there was something in Holly Springs I needed. Okay, this story is called The Great Escape. That, that something was a pair of SP1 PV speakers that were PA speakers and I had left them there and David uh, they had broken you know maybe they broke David maybe they broke okay and one night David said that we couldn't have the gig money because they had to be we had to fix the speakers okay so that might be true and, uh, but the bottom line was I left the speakers with David when I left and, uh, David had the speakers. So I get up to juniors and I go and I talk to junior and I said, Hey, I'm here. Those speakers, you know, junior are mine. He sat in the same chair every time I can still see it on the back of my album down at the juke. This is true, man. I this, I don't care what you think. You go look at the record down at the juke. Billy Gibson pointed this out to me. I didn't notice it. If you look at the picture of down at the juke, in the back, there, 
there's a, a photograph and there is images of people that are not there that we took on the photograph. There's a guy shooting pool that was not there. We went in there at Sunday in the daytime. I had Kent Kimbrough open the place up for me so we could take the picture. And there is an image of what appears to be Junior sitting in his chair. <clears throat> I don't know how to explain stuff like that. Uh, I should do a blue stories on my experiences with the paranormal because I've, I've had a bunch, you know. I am haunted, okay? So dig it. So I, I get up there and I tell Junior I'm, I'm here for the speakers and he's like, well, they're your speakers. Go ahead and, and take them, you know? So I know it. I knew it wasn't that simple. <laughs> okay. You know, I didn't know a lot, but I knew it. I had been down there long enough playing and having the time of my life to know that it was not that simple that I would just walk away with those that day, regardless of whether the fact that they were mine or not, there were things at play, you know? So, um, I, uh, I went up and I talked to David on a break and I said, Hey David, um, uh, he said, Oh, it's great to see you, you know, Hey Jay, you know, what you doing and da 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 da. And uh, I said, hey man, I'm here. You know, look, I'm, I'm on my way back home and I, I, I'm i gonna start my own band. I really need to take them speakers. And he says, oh man, you can't take those speakers. You know, here at CD's guys, there's a whole new crew of guys except for Kenny, you know, um, you know, playing there. Um, but there's a couple of guys, you know, Kenny and Artemis Lesur. okay? That's an important one. Um, I'll tell you about that in a minute. They were still there, but some, you know, there's a keyboard player and another guitar player. These guys that I had never met before. He said, listen, these guys just did a gig for free to pay for these speakers. So unless you want to pay everybody, you know, all the money that we spent into fixing these speakers, you can't take the speakers. And I'm like, David, that's not fair. I did a gig for free. And so did Kenny did a gig for free to fix those speakers the first time you said. He said, well, they broke again, you know. And, and I said, oh, man, you know, please, man. You know, now I'm down to please, right? Like, that's going to work. He's like, Jason, you know, you know, you go, you'll get some other speakers. We need these, right? So I was like, oh, man. So anyway, I just went and I got drunk. Now, for some reason... There was like uh, a white girl there that night with like a couple of other people. I, I believe she was with maybe Luther and Cody Dickinson, okay, that were up there that night. And, um, you know, I, I ended up making out with her behind the, sh the, the, sh the juke joint and the stars were beautiful and I was... Beautiful, and I was smoking weed, and I was I I drank two half pints of that corn lit liquor, and one is enough. And um, so I had a pint in me, and uh, I uh, they uh, the Living Blues was there that night, the magazine, and they were shooting pictures of the Kimbros and Burnsides after the show was over, like all posing and stuff. And the place had mostly cleared out and I'm just still sitting there. I'm like gonna argue with David one last time, probably get my ass whooped or worse. And, um, you know, fun, you know what happens is a, a knife fight breaks out in the parking lot. And I'm not gonna say who between. And, um, this was rare. I mean, in Holly Springs at Sue's, that maybe wasn't so rare, but at, at Junior's, things were pretty peaceful. And I think most stories you will hear from people who went and visited who are not from there are, are positive that they were treated very kindly and that there were no problems down there. You know, as a matter of fact, I think I was the one that treated most people who weren't from there rotten. Like, I stole the guy's harmonica one time, and you know what I mean? And I, like, 
took money for people who were buying weed and didn't come back and took their weed or whatever. You know, I was rotten. You know what I mean? I was, tr I was trying to be a player. You know what I mean? I was just a punk. You know, I'm sorry to all those people. I owe you a harmonica. So, like... I was just a sleaze ball, but but anyway, this, this this was rare. This fight, so the whole club clears out. Like, whew, here I am sitting there with the fucking speakers. So there's a cement floor, and the speakers got these metal casters on them. So I start trying to drag them, and they're making like this god awful noise. <laughs> It's loud, like, and the, it's reverberating throughout this whole juke joint. And, which, you know, the juke joint's now burned down. You know, it burned down. It had burned down once before that. And so, um, anyway, uh, I, I turned to Autumnus, who was, you know, the only one there. And I said, Autumnus, who was my friend? I used to kick it with Autumnus in the daytime when I lived there. And we used to talk. And he came up in the church... And he was a good guy. I mean, everybody came up in the church there, but Artemis was really into the church. And, you know, he was a good guy. And, uh, and he, he treated me pretty, more than fairly, more than I deserved to be treated well, he did. And uh, I said, Artemis, you have to help me get these speakers into my car. I had this beat up Nissan Pathfinder that was basically held together with bungee cords and shit that my mother had given me, and I had beaten the fuck over the years, okay? And, uh, man, I, uh, he was like, no, I can't help you. David will kill us if he finds out. And he's not kidding. Like, like we could have been killed for, like, trying to do this. And I said, no, no, you have to help me. I'm going to do this either way, so please help me. Maybe we can get it. He helped me lift the speakers and get them out of there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I get the speakers out. I get one in the back. I had, I had cleared an area in the back of the, of the, of the, of the car, the, the, the truck, whatever, thinking it was big enough for two. Well, when I put one in, it was clear. I wasn't going to get the other one in. So I had to stick the other one in the passenger side seat. And it was in there so far that I couldn't move the shifter. To put it in reverse, so I had to lean on the speaker just to get the shifter engaged. And then when I let go, the shifter's all bending, right? So I fucking tear out of there. Down the road, right? And then, you know, man, not fucking 15, 30, 45 seconds later, after I tear out, I hear another set of tires right behind me. I know exactly who that is. So, I'm off, all right? Now, they don't call it the hill country for no reason. It's boom, boom, boom. And every time I get to the top of one of those hills, I see that set of headlights getting a little closer. So, I'm flying as fast as I can, trying to get to 78 so I can get back up to the road, okay? Went out of nowhere. That old Pathfinder quits. Boom. Nothing. No power. No lights. Nothing. And I start coasting. Uh, I don't know, by the grace of God or something, there was a little gravel road that went off this way. You know, it like met up with the other one like this. And I was able to coast right around into that and that kudzu that grows so thick, it makes like a wall. It's like a wall. It's this bush that grows all over Mississippi. I understand it was a bad import or something, but it's really rather beautiful. And it was especially beautiful to me at that time. And I hung out back there and I watched as David drove chasing me and passed me. So here I am sitting in the middle of nowhere, Mississippi, in a car full of stolen gear that belonged to me. <laughs> David. All right. And uh, I have no vehicle. So, you know, what's going to happen? You know, somebody's going to find me. What am I going to do? And this is before cell phones. This is like 
97, 96, 97, I don't know. So like, what do I do? I just sit there for about an hour. And I'm just thinking, man, just thinking. You know, I'm still drunk, too. Finally, I started the car. And it started right up. And I drove it all the way home to Maine. <laughs> Couple of months later, I called Katie Kimbrough on the phone. And I said, hey, man. I said, uh, yeah, would I ever, will I ever be able to come back there? <laughs> he said to me, I wouldn't come back right away. And I said, okay. I said, okay. <laughs> he said, uh, he said, but, uh, he goes, uh, he goes, well, right after you tore out of there, he goes, <laughs> he goes, we lost you on the road somewhere. And I said, yeah, yeah. I said, I know you did. And he said, uh. He said, well, I, he goes, I just turned to David right about that time. And I said, he said he was going to come in and get his speakers. And that's exactly what he did. <laughs> so uh, anyway, uh, years and years later, I went back down there to do just just a, like what was it last year. I went back down there to do a, 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 a workshop with Adam. And I went to David's juke joint, which was Sue's, okay, which he bought Sue's and redid it, and it's beautiful, and it's wonderful, and I, and I met up with David again. David again, and he didn't bring anything up about that. <laughs> so I guess we're good. Um, but, uh. We're more than good. If I had those SP1s today, or if I had a PA system today, I would give that PA system to David. Um, I don't have much, you know, really of anything. Um, uh, but I do have, uh, I do have something to, to offer, and maybe not in the way of, of money or whatever, but I would like to, to say thank you to, to David Kimbrough and and Kent Kimbrough and Artemis Lasur and and and, uh, and Gary Burnside and and uh, Dwayne Burnside and all them people up there for putting up with a moon cat and messing with me. Um, I know I was difficult and hard to understand, but you always hard to understand to me too. <laughs> but I was in your home, and I appreciate that. And uh, it was an opportunity I will cherish the rest of my life. Um, I have so many stories about that area, but I, I, I saw all night long, played all night long, many occasions. Nobody but you meet me in the city. I was there when those songs were played every Sunday uh, for like what I say, 15, 17, 18 months, something like that. It was an incredible opportunity. It was an incredible opportunity to play and learn with David Kimbrough. And if you guys don't know R.L. Burnside and Junior Kimbrough, you best check it out. Okay, because I'm pretty sure everybody knows. They got famous. You know what happened? Uh, uh, R.L. did a punk record with John Spencer and blew up. And next thing you know, he was, the music's in Julia Roberts movies. And then, and then, uh, and then you know, unfortunately, Junior died. And that helped cement his legacy and it what a shame that you know you have to die these days you know to, to get recognized and, and, and even then you know pat ramsey you know that didn't work for pat pat always thought that would work for him it didn't work for him um, but uh yeah now they blew up after that and then you know and everybody started saying after that oh like i play hill country music well, you know, I, that record I recorded, that one I was telling you about down at the Juke, I sent that into Living Blues in 1997, you know, and it, it was my take on that music. So it was punk. It was punked up. I was doing a punk version way before the John Spencer did that, before any of that shit. And, and, uh, and Living Blues called it punk rock blues as an insult. Okay, now that's a fucking genre. <laughs> so you see what I was putting down. I was stealing shit way before other people were stealing shit. Those fuckers invented it. Okay? They invented it. 
and there's cats sitting down there that are not touring, that are not making a lot of money, and that are not on record labels, and that are not being talked about, like David Kimbrough, that, des that deserve to be talked about. Okay, why is that happening? You know, I, I don't know, but I, I, would, I would have to agree that maybe there are some things at play, okay? And I don't think it's fair and I just think that every one of you should go to could should go to Holly Springs and find a way to put some money in David Kimbrough's pocket, okay? And um, if that means buying a CD from him directly, not from the record label, but from him directly, or a T-shirt, or buying some drinks, some punch spiked with some corn liquor, or going down there on a Sunday and telling him that Jason Ritchie sent you. And, and here's five bucks so that he can keep the music on or 10 or 20 or 100 or whatever it is you can afford, I would appreciate it. By the way, I'm poor too. You can send money to me through PayPal if you want to. But if not, I'd rather you sent the money to David today somehow. Anyway, I love you all. Thank you so much for listening to 50 Minutes of a Blues Story. Uh, I appreciate it. But this was going to be a long one. The next ones won't be so long. All right. Have a wonderful day. I'll talk to you.